So folks, we'll get started here. Um, feel free to continue getting coffee, getting handouts, signing in, whatever you need to do. Um, I just have a couple of announcements, and then I'll, I'll introduce the session and hand things over to our guests. Uh, we're so happy to have you all here. This is the uh, Craft Teaching Workshop, All the World's a Stage, the Pedagogical, Pedagogical Challenge of World Religions. Um, in two weeks, November 6th, Friday at noon, we have the Quarterly Dean Center uh, to bring a distinguished alum of the Divinity School back for a seminar focused on issues of force design and institutional context. If you RSVP for that, you may get free lunch if you're in the first 25 people to RSVP. And there are still lunches available, so please do that. One other announcement is the, the Arts of Teaching session on um, using images to teach religion. The, the day has been changed. It's now on Monday, uh, November 16th, still at 4.30 p.m., and that's uh, that's right upstairs. So please check our schedule for other things going on, and we look forward to seeing you at other, other events. So world religions. I just got back um, from Salt Lake City, where over the last week the Parliament of World Religions was meeting. And the Parliament of World Religions was, as many of you know, founded in 1893 right here in Chicago during the World's Fair and associated with the World's Fair, um, to bring together representatives of the world's religions, to meet one another, to encounter each other, and to learn about each other's traditions. Um, this is a distinctly modern and modernist project. And um, in 1993, it was reinvented. Um, and it's been happening every couple years since. But it's changed rather dramatically because, not least, because not anyone, nobody can really agree on what world religions are and what it means for them to encounter one another, who is a representative, what should count as religion in the first place and what shouldn't. And I only bring this up because while this is a, you know, this is an international initiative, it's very much echoed in our classrooms. And it's echoed in the fact that many of us are going to be called upon to teach classes in world religions or religious worlds or any number of other uh, analogous kinds of formulations that our, that our various institutions may, uh, may bequeath to us when we arrive as fresh-faced faculty. Um, and so the craft teaching program thought it was important to really get inside this problem of what, A, what is world religions? How is it construed differently by different people in different places? And then how can it be a pedagogically productive uh, kind of experience for our students and not just something that is you know, a kind of catch-all for uh, a way into the field. So we've got three distinguished guests. I'll leave things over to them to introduce themselves. Um, and let me hand it over first to Dove Weiss. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, it's, uh, my name is Dove Weiss. Uh, spent seven years here from 04 to 2011. Uh, it's just really great to be back in Swift Hall. Can you hear me? Is back there? Okay. If you can't hear, move up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, two and a half hours south of here, but I live in Chicago. And I, uh, I commute. I stay over in Champaign two nights a week. Um, I started in the fall of 2011. And in fall of 2012, the head of the uh, the department, uh, I, I'm in the Department of Religion, I teach Judaism, the history of Judaism. The head of the department asked me to teach world uh, religions, and I shaked. I was really nervous, because I'll confess, I know so little about hin Hinduism and Buddhism uh, that it really, really got me worried. Um, I'm currently teaching it for my third time, and it's been one of the most amazing uh, experiences of my life. I love teaching the course. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, the course, and I, you, you have the syllabus? Yeah, that's the literature. We, we have a couple of copies for it, but um, if you don't have it in hard copy, it is on the schedule. It's on the uh, the announcement about the session. It's all available in, in PDF form. OK, so just a little bit about, uh, about the course. Uh, the, the course is rotated between myself and two of my colleagues. One of them is Jonathan Ebel, who, who also got his doctorate here. Mm -hmm. Uh, the course enrolls close to 600 students, and the course meets twice a week for 50 minutes, where there's lecture, and then the students are broken up into into uh, 30, and they meet with once a week they meet with their TA, and the course 
has seven, uh, seven TAs. It's a 15 week course. The lectures are for 50 minutes and then they meet with their TA. We call section with their, with their TA for 50 minutes. Um, we have a quiz, a quiz each week. Um, and the quiz is done to make sure that they show up to lecture. Quizzes are based on lectures. There's a midterm, a final, two papers. Um, what makes this course, I think, different, uh, both amazing and also complicated, is that the course is taught by the entire department. Meaning, thankfully, I don't teach Buddhism, I, I teach Judaism whenever I do the course, and I give an introductory lecture on the study of world religions, what does it mean to study a religion from an academic perspective, I'll give a review session, um, but the, each of the religions is taught by my colleagues. Who are, who are experts in, in their own area. Um, so, uh, thankfully, I don't have to teach uh, uh, the Eastern religion. So, what are the challenges, uh, the major challenges of the course, and how do I meet them? Um, the, the key challenge is, the course is taught by seven, eight different people. And how do you create um, thematic consistency? You know, how do you create an organizational structure that ties everything together. And that's the key issue that we struggle with, continuity. Right? It, it often seems disjointed because scholars in Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, they're all kind of thinking about our own area, our religion, in very different ways. We're asking different questions. We're focusing on different times. So uh, students also often get kind of um, lost. Um, people have different styles. So that's a, a, a something that we really struggle with. Um, and one of the ways that we've we've tried to deal with that is to come up with you know certain questions, certain key concepts that when we go through each religion, students will have to think about okay, what is you know what is ultimate reality for each religion? What is the ultimate? What is what what is the problem? The major problem that each religion is addressing? Um, how does each religion think about how to uh, achieve? What are the means to achieve that ideal? Right. So at least you have kind of rubric questions to ask that students can at least have some purchase on, on, on the, 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 the religion that they're studying. Sometimes we use uh, Nini Smart's uh, seven or eight dimensions of religion, you know, the doctrinal, the ritual, the mythic. The, um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. We're, we're constantly um, re reading and rethinking about how we can make the course um, better. Um, and there are moments when many of us feel like let's dump this model and let's just have this course be taught by one person. Okay, um, so obviously we'll lose in terms of you're not, the students won't be hearing from the experts. You know, let's say the expert in Islam, but at least they'll have some of the, the continuity, the, organiz the organization, even if they'll lose out on hearing from a real expert in the field. And I should say sometimes. I was just mentioning this to Lucy, Lucy Flick. Sometimes the experts are really the worst in teaching uh, this course because everything is nuanced you know, 20, 30 times and the students are completely lost. Um, I had a, there was one, one semester where uh, the, the scholar of Buddhism wasn't available. And um, so I asked uh, my colleague who, who teaches Christianity, who also know, knows Buddhism pretty well, to, to teach Buddhism. And I think it worked so much better because he really spoke in over generalizations, <laughs> which really helped, helped, uh, helped you know, students have some sense of what's happening. Um, so we still think about that. Um, there's also a little bit of sensitivity. Sometimes I feel like, um, let's say, I could, I could teach a religion maybe better than a real expert, but I don't want to hurt the expert's feelings. He's a colleague of mine. How can I not invite him? One of my colleagues, oh, this is Tate. <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next. Uh, <laughs> one of my colleagues from the other department, from not my department, uh, you know, not the not the greatest teacher. Let's just put it that way. And uh, so I struggle with. Well, for me personally, of course, I have to invite my colleague to teach his or her, her, her religion. But I worry about. I don't know if that's the best decision for the students in the class. Um, uh, another major problem, of course, is the amount of time that's devoted. It's just so hard, this course, because we're running through Buddhism in two weeks, you know, Christianity in two weeks, Hinduism in two weeks. 
the students get dizzy because we're moving so, so quickly. Um, we always struggle with which textbook to use. Uh, we haven't really found an excellent textbook uh, yet. Uh, the course also requires students to write, uh, write two papers, and that's also a difficult thing. How do you ask students who are just getting a little, uh, getting their feet wet with each religion to write on the religion that they, they know so little, that they know so little about? So, you know, re recently we 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 thought that it was important for them to have some engagement with primary text, so at least they can have some some some. Purchase and something to hold on to in terms of a religious uh, a, a religious tradition. Um, yeah, An another big challenge. And I think this is a challenge for for huge classroom settings. Is everybody is always on um, um, on Facebook? I mean, that's a key problem. I, I I once thought I gave this great lecture. And I was like, yeah, I rock that. And, and I saw my TA, and he and, and I said, well, wasn't that amazing? And he said, yeah, but half of the students were on Facebook. So we decided to just knock out all technology. Students are not allowed to open up anything. Um, and we thought it would be World War III. And it actually wasn't. I mean, they were like, OK, sure. And that really made a key, a, a big uh, big difference in the in, in course. Do we have how much time did that take? Um, we started. Call it 10 after. Okay. You start 10 after? I start 10 after. Okay, great. Um, what do I enjoy about this course? Um, I have learned so much from this course. Uh, I've learned so much about uh, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and, uh, and shamanism and um, you know Shinto uh, and even you know Islam. And I've learned a lot about other religions, but I've also learned a lot about, I've also it's forced me to rethink about Judaism and what makes Judaism, you know, distinctive from other religions. It really pushes you to think very broad, very big, um, and it's really challenging to think about how, like, for my, how do I, how do I teach Judaism in three hours? What is the, what is important? What's not important? You know, how can I leave that out? How can I leave that out? And it's a lot of fun. Um, I also should add, it's also great working with TAs. I work with seven TAs, and that's a lot of fun. Um, just getting to know the graduate students and working with them. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's also just really kind of cool walking into a classroom and saying, hey, I'm, I'm teaching a class of 600 students. So there's definitely an, e an element of ego. And it's important to recognize that, but that it's, it's pretty cool. It also helps, um, it helps ex uh, give you exposure to uh, many students and hopefully uh, you can interest students in either considering studying with you in other courses or considering, you know, perhaps minor or majoring in, in religion. Um, what other strategies do we use to, to help organize the course? Um, so we do two religions in, in, in one week. It, uh, we, do, we do, sorry, we do each religion for about two weeks. And it's always, of course, difficult in, when we sit down and decide well, which which religion is considered a world religion. I often get a lot of flack because we don't have Sikhism, but we have Judaism. And they say, well, you know, there, there are double the amount of, of Sikhs in the, in the world uh, than Jews. And I always have to try to defend um, the teaching of Judaism. Um, what do you say? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I say two things. I say, obviously, of course, the influence of Judaism on Christianity and, and, and Islam. I say, look, you know, Judaism introduced, you know, a very important concept in the world, and that's God, G-O-D. And the other thing is, um, I'm a scholar of Judaism, so <laughs> I want Judaism in the, in the course. Um, we we all we always require PowerPoints uh, to be put on, up online before class that morning. So what students do is they download the, the PowerPoint slides, and that they take notes on their PowerPoint slides, rather than having to, of course, write everything again on, 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 that are on the slides. Um, and, and we find that helpful. Um, one of the key challenges is the textbook that we give them sometimes often doesn't correlate to the lectures that they're hearing because the scholars that kind of teach their, their religion 
they usually don't read the textbook. Even though we try to get them to read the textbook, they don't read the textbook because they're going to say what they're going to say and whatever. Um, so is it, we struggle with that as well. Um, you know, to the, the, the extent, how much, how much should the, the lecture be connected to the textbook? And maybe that's a good thing, that the scholar is discussing things that, that aren't related to the textbook. Certainly, you don't want to repeat. You don't want to be repetitive, but obviously it isn't. It would be more helpful if, if my colleagues read the textbook, so at least they know what the students are reading or what, what they, they, have, um, they have read. Um, I would say a motto for this course is, uh, is less is better. That's my big motto, less is better. So when I ask my colleagues to send me their primary text, I say less is better. When my colleagues uh, 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 lecture on their religion, I always say to them, less is better. Because we have a tendency, and I'm, I'm, I was so guilty of that the first two years that I taught in the course, because I wanted to get everything in there. I wanted to, uh, you know, how could you leave out, you know, Joseph Cairo from the 16th century? How could you leave out this great figure and that great movement and this? So I packed everything in and I, I, I spoke, probably like I'm speaking now, kind of very you know, quickly, because uh, I wanted to get everything in. And, and I realized that you should slow down, get more, you know, and be clearer. And students are hearing this for the first time. They can't think that, 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 that quickly. And they need to hear a concept you know, mentioned two or three times in different ways before they can really digest it and assimilate it. So it's painful for me. But you know, every year, I, cu I keep on cutting. I keep on cutting the, the PowerPoint slides. Um, so yeah, I mean, so, so it's a multiple challenge. I have to work with students. And I get like 20, 30 emails a day from students. And the goal is to try to you know, respond by saying, first, talk to your TA. Um, I have to oversee my TAs and make sure that the grading is consistent. This is a huge problem we once had, where, where, where TAs had, you know, some of them graded very leniently, some of them very, very harshly. Um, I have to make sure TAs are on the ball. The TAs show up to, 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 to lecture. Um, also, another key thing that we realized is, and this is like a, sounds like a small thing, but it actually was really important. So the course meets Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, first thing in the morning, and then they meet with their section, their TAs on Thursday or Friday, and we realize that it's very important um, not to do two religions in one week. Meaning to, to finish off a religion on a Thursday. We used to finish off, let's say, Judaism on Tuesday, and then Christian, well, let me, that's, that's an example. Let's say finish off Buddhism on a Tuesday, and then start Judaism on a Thursday, and then when you meet the section, it always uh, kind of uh, complicates things. What would I wish I had known before? Um, that A, is that I need, better, I need better mentoring, and it's okay to ask. When I got this course, I really didn't know what to do, and I was kind of afraid to, to ask because that would imply maybe that I don't know what I'm doing, and, which is the truth. But it's okay, it's okay, because it's, it's a new experience. Um, I wish I would have known Hinduism and Buddhism better than I did. Um, I, I, it was a little bit embarrassing for me, you know, not, not having any knowledge, really, of Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, the other thing is, I wish I had known that um, it's okay also to rely on TAs, and it's also okay to rely on TAs who had been involved in this course for so many years. Um, and they were really, really helpful. I had this one guy who had been doing this for four or five years. Um, and it was a little bit, at times, difficult to navigate, because I think he, he knew world religions better than I did. And I was, and I was supposedly the professor. And that was a, a, a complicated dynamic between uh, the, the, the two of us. Um, I'll just leave with this, and I'm happy to talk more during the question period and answer period, is, um, yeah, just make sure, just make sure to take a basic course in world religions if you haven't done so. Um, and what I did, I'm not afraid to admit it, is I went to the great courses online. I love the great courses. If you haven't seen the great courses, I took a course in, uh, in world religions from a great scholar, and I absolutely, uh, absolutely loved it. So I wish I would have done that before starting that. So I guess I'll stop then and fantastic. Yeah. That's a good start. Thanks very much, Joe Weiss. And now we'll have Jim Halstead from the department.
My name is Jim Halstead. And a little later on in your packet, there's the syllabus for the course that I teach. Um, and there's two of them at DePaul. Uh, Honors 104 is, uh, will have packed of 22 students in the classroom. That's religious worldviews and ethical perspectives. And it's an honors course, and that's the syllabus you have. And then the second course we have is in the general department, um, religious worldviews and comparative perspective. And that's capped at 40. So when I hear of 600 students, I just say, I have no idea what I would do with 600 students, except I don't know what I'd do. Um, DePaul University. Uh, in the liberal, uh, most of our students, there's 23,000 students there. And about uh, 13,000 or so, give or take a thousand, are undergraduates. Every undergraduate takes two religion courses, and, and there's 104 courses on the books to pick from. Um, one of them is, is these, but this Honors 104 is a required course in the Honors program. Um, I've been there 28 years teaching, and this is just part of my regular repertoire. Um, things I want to, to say. Can I use your for time much. We want to pull this up. Number one, I, oh, my initial starting question is always, how do students learn? It is not what do teachers do. It is how do students learn? Uh, better yet, how did I learn? Uh, and the answer, when I answer that question is, uh, we learn to do by doing. Therefore, the student's got to do the work. Um, the student has to do the reading if they're, if they're going to learn. They've got to do the thinking, which is why I take a walk and think. They've got to do the writing, um, and it's my job as teacher to uh, design a framework in which students can learn. Um, and like I say, as I think of how do I learn, uh, whenever I learn anything, it's by doing it. Um, they they got to do it. And so the art becomes uh, find things for them to do, and the syllabus will, will reflect that. On, on the, the other thing that I believe about this is, is that different students learn in different ways. Um, those people in the education school are right about that point. Um, and in the classroom of 40, I just have learned to accept the fact that I'm not going to get to everybody. Um, I wish things were different, but it's not going to work that way. And in the classroom of 20, it's going to be a little easier, but. In, in the world of mass education that we live in, um, these are not tutorials, much to my unhappiness at some times, much to my delight at other times, depending on who the student is. That being said, on the first day of class, students get three pieces of, of material. You have, you have them. They get the syllabus. And then they get two sheets. One is the, the general roadmap. Where is this class going? And with this little statement of, my dear ladies and gentlemen, by the time, and sometimes I give them with, with writing, sometimes just with numbers, but it's always, you're going to fill in this grand sheet in, over the next 10 weeks. We're not on semesters, we're on quarters. That means 30 contact hours. Um, this one, this is what it looks like by the end. As I say, sometimes it's fill in as we go along. The other sheet they have is you're going to be reading a bunch of people, and you're going to be listening to me and talking to a bunch of other people. I promise you, you will get lost in the material unless you have a way to organize. Um, and so here's your organizational chart. All the things that you're going to read uh, and think about, uh, better yet, many of the things that you're going to read and think about if you decide to do the work in this class, you're going to be able to fit it into this chart. This is the way to organize stuff. And the reason I do it is because I go, how do I learn? Well, just the way my mind works. i got to organize and i got to compare and contrast. Uh, I need to see it visually in front of me, and I make it a point, do not do this on computers, because um, there's a different thing that happens in the human brain when you write with your hands on paper with ink and a pen than if you type with fingers. And I go, I'll type my emails with fingers, but for this kind of stuff, I want you to write. Um, so that's the, these two charts. Um, there is this massive problem of uh, what is religion, all the things that Aaron was talking about. I grant all that. My own work was done at Louvain in Belgium. Mm -hmm. And the reason I went there is because I wanted to study with a certain person. And so my, my, other, my thing about this is, look, what you're getting is the way I put, the way Jim Halstead puts together stuff 
in this time uh, in September of 2015. I will teach this probably differently next time as I think about it differently. But this is my present thought on the topic. Uh, think with me and. Um, this is not etched in stone. This is not like arithmetic 101. So yeah, it varies. So think with me for the next 10 weeks, and um, you're going to be better off as an 18 to 22 year old undergraduate student if you think with me for 10 weeks and then do it. Then you've got a life to live. Go and have a good time, and I'll see you at your graduation. There, um, so my thing about this is, um, there are certain language that I want people to learn, learn, knowing full well there's other language systems, but please, please learn the cosmo uh, the way I think about this stuff is people develop cosmologies and anthropologies, and they're not all the same, and when you leave here in 10 weeks, I hope you're conversant in multiple different ones, and on the far right, well, what do you think about this? At age 20, knowing full well you'll probably change your mind on this by the time you're 40 and 60 and but that's where we are because that's the way religious studies is if you look so that's what this chart is about um, i do not have the nerve to say no technology so it'd be for for me with 20 and 40 students and not being as bold which is i'm i'm ready to change my mind on this one it's like okay who knows when freud leave lived you don't would you please Google that? We need it. And by the way, would you also please Google, would you all call up the future of an illusion for me, please? And get that so here's the website, go to it. In other words, yeah, I don't want, they're going to, I don't know, yeah, they're going to use it. This is like judo. How do you work with them <laughs> such that they're, okay. It just becomes a Yeah. And so, yes, you do have the book in front of you, I hope. No, they don't. Uh, it's online. Please, here's the website, and so because we're going to read it very closely. Part of filling in the form, uh, let's just stick on the Freud one. Um, where, as, as, as the assignment, go read, and you're going to fill in this chart. Where does Freud answer the question? What kind of? Please write that down. A few key words, and please put a page number in there. Um, I work from the assumption anybody can go into a bar or go into an oral examination and talk. And they can talk in generalities, and it's usually pretty entertaining. Um, it's no, usually not very precise and not very detailed. And so I'm perfectly willing to give you a C or a D if you can entertain me and kind of be, talk around the topic intelligently, and you know, that was impressive. That's a C. You want to be? Can you, uh, what page number does he say that on? Can I please have the quotation where, where, you know, where it's a, a mechanical universe uh, and you must discover yourself in the machinery of the universe? Got a page? Got a sentence? Thank you very much. Got it. Want an A? Give me an informed comment. Not three informed comments. Is, is he right? Would Einstein agree with that? Would the quantum physicists agree with that? Uh, does the book of Genesis agree with that? Ah, so you can put what this man, and you've got the specific places of where he says what he says. You can put them in dialogue. Yeah, to me, that's the mark of a liberally educated young adult. Most of the students that we teach at DePaul are not religious studies majors. They are uh, taking courses in their liberal studies program, and so please be able to, please relate stuff you learned in religion to things that you learned in the biological sciences or the physics department, or what did you learn in the English department? Um, how about the music people? So that there's a constant thing of, you know, if that's what Freud says, that's marvelous, or this is what William James says, that's marvelous, you've got the page, you've got the sentence, you've got the idea. How's that gonna float in another department? You're right, they don't agree at all. That's why I want what you think over on the far right side. Knowing full well, you're probably going to change your mind in 20 years or so. Um, I normally do, as you see, four theorists. Uh, Freud, Berger, William James, and me. Um, <laughs> and I figure a professor is supposed to profess something. Yeah. <laughs> so here's, here's what I'm thinking in spring of 2015 about these categories. Subject to change, 
um, when I read more, think more, or have a different kind of experience in life. And then let's take, then I always, always take two people quite different, and how do they deal with those same questions? DL stands for the Dalai Lama. Um, they watch the movie, Kundun, um, rather than read the book, My Land, uh, I forget it, a little white book. But then he's got a marvelous little book um, whose name escapes me at the moment, but it's in the syllabus, uh, where he's going to address these questions. And, and they're going to get a model of a, uh, of a human being who's talking with lots of others. And I'm going to be emphasizing, this is what an intelligent and liberally educated person like the Dalai Lama or you do. You talk to people outside your discipline and you let your ideas develop over time as he has done. Notice how he says he has changed. Well, I would expect you would be doing the same thing. So we, I, this, for ta last quarter, I used the Dalai Lama and I used Augustine and Pippo. That is one Tibetan Buddhist and <coughs> one fifth century Christian. Um, Augustine, sometimes the other person that I have had great success teaching uh, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer in there, emphasizing Bonhoeffer's spiritual journey the spiritual and theological journey, and the changes in his life. And with the, when then posing questions, how do you get, move from uh, a German elitist to a kind of an evangelical type to a, a murder plotter, uh, or at least a killing plotter? Is murder and killing the same thing? Let's think about that some. And so those are our people. And then what did you learn growing up, your religious leader, if you had one? What did your rabbi? your imam, your minister, your pre what did they teach you in the institution to which you went as a child? And the, that's very frequently at DePaul left blank. They didn't learn anything. Well, fine. What did your mom and dad teach you? What did they say to you the first time you went to a funeral? Um, please fill in the eschatology box now. Uh, that's what your mom and dad taught you happened to that dead person. Oh, they ducked the question, huh? Why don't you just put a, write that in? duck the question. Now, what do you think? You've been to some funerals yourself, my dear college students. What do you think happens now? That's quite different than what the Dalai Lama thinks, isn't it? Oh, oh. please be with that one for a while. So that's filling in this box. You'll notice the other one, this one, where we are. I want him to learn uh, three major chunks of stuff uh, about religious studies. They're going to come into class, at least at the fall, on their first day with, with already a preset idea of who, uh, of what this, what this course is going to be. It's a religions course in a Catholic university. Oh my God, I'm about to get indoctrinated. And moreover, it's going to be done by a Catholic priest. Oh God. <laughs> at which point, ladies and gentlemen, this is religious studies, not theology. If you want to talk, to, if you want me to indoctrinate you, please come to mass on Sunday, and I'll do my absolute best. I love the indoctrinating experience. And in this classroom, I have a different agenda. I want to make you smart and thoughtful. Uh, I want to make you, as the as the objectives of the university are, and that's why it's in the syllabus, both the objectives of the university, the learning goals, as well as the liberal studies goals. That's what I'm trying to do in this classroom. And so you need to know, and then we just go down the left side. Where does this discipline come from? What are the methods doing? And secondly, I want them to learn something about Tibetan Buddhism, if I'm doing that. Or they might, uh, whatever religion, because those two, uh, the DL and the Augustine, those change quarter to quarter. Um, how do you locate some of this stuff? How do you keep it straight? Well, this is the way I did it in spring quarter of this year. I, I have no idea how winter quarter of next year I'll be doing this, but something's going to go about religions. Aha, uh -huh. there's a whole group of religions that that quarter I call them all material monists. One substance and the substance is matter. Oh, oh, there's a bunch of them that fit in today. Yeah, there really are. Yeah, we're not all that creative. Everybody's got their own religion. No, they don't. We're not that creative. They got their little twists on stuff, perhaps. And then at the far right, where do all these religions come from in the first place? Uh, and so those things are, are constantly intermingled. Normally two and three are the things that intermingle. Um, and the reason for the sheet is, okay, now uh, constantly, please go to Roman numeral two. I'm gonna talk a little about that, ask you to talk a little about that, do some group work perhaps if it's, a, if it's in the class of 40. Now we're over in Roman numeral number three, please number five. 
this notion of degrees of certitude of truth claims. Oh my God. Remember what you learned in philosophy epistemology? Let's use that right now. That's what this is about. Last thing I want to say is assignments. Um, one thing I've learned about syllabi, uh, one of my things I'm most proud of as a teacher, I've had one great challenge in the last 28 years. A student got a B rather than a B plus. Um, and the reason for the no great challenge is because it's utterly clear what I want you to do, such that if you look under appendix uh, 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 D, for example, all right. In paper two, you're to find, interview, report on, analyze, and evaluate the spiritual religious experience of a chronologically mature person. Whether they're emotionally mature is a whole different <laughs> That means they got to be over 40. So don't go to your, I don't want you interviewing your fellow residence hall person or your boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, get someone over 40 who's been beaten up by life a little bit and uh, has had some time to think. Now, then, having read sections of William James' The Varieties of Religious Experience, a C paper will do these things. And if all you want to see in this course, fine. Your paper ends right there. Um, and then I just would tell them all this. And more than once in my undergraduate career did I take my C and D like a man and be glad I got my four credits and got out of there. And I don't expect any more from you guys than I put out as an undergrad. So please take your C, your marvelously average, I know your mom doesn't agree with me on this point, but <laughs> uh, Freud does. Um, <laughs> uh, the B paper goes further. The B paper, and see, so what I'm saying here is there's mental processes that I want students to go through, that I go through, as I understand the people, now related to other people for a B, and then do I have anything at all intelligent to say about that which I have compared and contrasted and intellectually played with. And you cannot possibly write this paper unless you take a walk around Lake Michigan and think. The goal here is not repeat what Halstead said. The goal here is that you think independently and frankly entertain me with something I've never thought of before, which I'm going to smile when I read your stuff. And you'll notice that um, certain students, they really do quit writing, and they, they admire the honesty, frankly. Um, and they get the honesty. And so, Again, if you say very precisely what you want and then model it in, in the classroom. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let it, what, is, what does the man say? What does the woman say right now? Where does it say that in the text? All right. Yeah, don't blow smoke at me. Give me a line, a page, a paragraph, and read me the sentence. Okay, good. Got that. Now, what do you think about that? Or how does it relate to other things you've learned in other classes? Now what do you think about it? So it's a, a constant practicing of really structured thinking because I'm saying I'm working with 18 to 22 year olds. This is not the University of Chicago. This is DePaul University and I got to teach people how to thinking processes. Um, uh, and after 10 weeks, by week eight, nine, and 10, yeah, they're, they're getting quite good at this in the honors program. I'm kind of delighted with this. and. <laughs> That's how I do Thanks very much, Professor Halstead. And now I'll have Kathy Benton from Lake Forest College. That's right. Um, well, I took a little bit of a different approach here uh, to the subject, although I, I am definitely going to get to nuts and bolts of teaching world religions. But I, um, as I thought about what to talk about today, I, I thought about talking to you a little bit about my own interaction with teaching world religions and, and what that means. Um, this is my 28th year also um, teaching at Lake Forest College. Lake Forest, some of you may know, but it's a small liberal arts college uh, just up the lake from here really. We have about 1,600 students and um, our class sizes are around 25. Sometimes you're lucky and you get a little bit smaller, but in the humanities, our class sizes are about 25. Um, while I was uh, in graduate school at Columbia in New York, I also did a lot of teaching. Uh, so I taught at Pace University, I taught at Hunter College, I taught at um, Marymount Terrytown, 
In other words, anywhere that I could get a job teaching. And of course, as a graduate student, the classes that we were usually asked to teach were world religions. So I have the experience of teaching world religions. However, when I came to Lake Forest College, um, I was again hired in some ways to teach world religions, but they had split it into two. So that one semester was called, and I apologize for my voice, um, <coughs> one semester was called um, Religions of the Middle East, fine. The other semester was called Eastern Spiritual Paths. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah, so, you know, I had just come out of Columbia, <clears throat> and so I was steeped in religious theory. I had lived in India. I had done my graduate work in India, so I had lived in other cultures. I had worked in other cultures. And here we had, to my mind, the essentialism that I was trying to move away from. So for one year, I was a new person, and I taught Eastern spiritual paths. But I had a very um, understanding chairperson. And so by the next year, we did get the course changed to Religions of Asia, uh, which felt a whole lot better to me than Eastern spiritual paths. Um, but, I, but I think this situation of um, in particular at small liberal arts colleges, but maybe also at private universities, maybe even at larger universities. Part of the problem is that all of these religion departments really started out historically as theology departments. And so you start out envisioning the study of religion as being similar to the study of theology, and it's really not. But when you use the theology lens, you're still looking for the right answer. You're, you're looking for the theological truth. As opposed to when you're studying religious traditions, you're really looking at what different communities think and believe and um, see as their cosmos, understanding the world from their perspectives, which is a very different kind of lens. Uh, saying things that you, you already know here. Um, but um, as I said, you know, I started, I came directly out of graduate school to Lake Forest College and uh, was expected to do this Religions of Asia course. Now, in the Religions of Asia course, um, it could be however I designed it. The idea was to do as many Asian religions as possible, but I changed that. And so I said we would do three traditions. We did Hinduism, um, Taoism, and uh, Buddhism. But what I found over the years as I was teaching this class was that it expanded so that it was, I did more Hinduism and more Taoism so that we'd only get to Buddhism at the very end. And I think what was happening is I could see that the students connected much more when you went more deeply into a religious tradition as opposed to trying to cover a lot of that and do more religious traditions. They really appreciated going more deeply into, uh, into one tradition. Um, just to end my story here, after, let's see, what was it, 19 years of teaching this two-part system, Religions of Asia, Religions of the Middle East, we finally were able to revamp the curriculum, and we now offer a full semester course in Hinduism, a full semester course in Buddhism, one in Islam, one in Judaism, and one in Christianity. So that um, pedagogically, it feels much better for us. Um, however, starting out, um, these are the kinds of courses probably that you'll be you'll be offered. And my my suggestion is you should go for it because in many ways these are wonderful courses to teach. Um, I, uh, one of the things that Aaron asked us to talk about and to think about as we were thinking about this today is what's satisfying about teaching world religions? And 
the, the first thing that I would have to say is it gave me this opportunity to learn religious traditions outside my area of expertise. I think Dove um, started us off by, by mentioning that. And truly, because you have to teach it, you really do learn these other religious traditions. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, it also gives you this opportunity to look at how to study religious traditions, especially because these traditions you're not so familiar with. You, uh, This is an opportunity to really think about what is important here and what does it mean to study a religious tradition. And what's it going to mean for 18 to 20 year olds? What are the questions that are interesting to me? What are the questions that will be interesting to them and relevant? Um, it's, this, it's this great opportunity to sift through all kinds of materials and read them. Things that you wanted to read your whole life, but you never had time to do it. And now you're forced to do it. Uh, so you get to read all these materials, but also to, um, to sift through them and figure out which materials you're going to be really good at teaching. So um, it's, it's not only the materials that are important for students to study, although that's part of it, but it's also what you're going to be good at teaching. The last thing that I have to say is that students, regardless of what we think, students tend to love these classes. That's right. Um, yeah, I don't know if my colleague can yeah, thinking the same. They absolutely love these classes. Um, I think the idea is they really would like to learn about traditions other than their own. They don't want to learn too much. They don't want to learn <laughs> too little. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle, sort of like Goldilocks. And these world religions courses are an opportunity to learn something about a bunch of different traditions. So I've come up with four strategies. Um, and so if I were designing a world religions class, these are the four things that I that I would do. Um, one is choose only a few traditions to look at. Now, at the expense of saying the textbook has 27 traditions, that's OK. And it, it might even be fine to have a textbook that looks at 27 traditions. And because you can say to students, um, there are lots of religious traditions in the world, and they're all worth studying. For this class, we only have time to look at these three. Uh, and then just be very upfront that you're only going to study these three. We have to let go of this idea that we need to do uh, coverage. We can't. Um, my area of study is India. When I think of teaching all the religions in India, it's it's mind-boggling. Um, you, know, you have the obvious ones: Hinduism, Islam, Jainism, Sikhism. But then you have to look at uh, St. Thomas Christians and um, well, all of the other myriad religious traditions in India. And the same would be true with Japan, with China. Um, so by, by focusing on just a couple traditions, you can do certain things. Um, one is you can do close readings of a few texts. So that's the training that I come out of. I think it's really helpful to do close readings of texts. I think students really like it, too, because you get involved with interesting questions. So what does it mean that in the Upanishads, there is this word Atman, and some people translate it as soul, and some people translate it as self. I think there's a better translation and a worse translation. What do we mean by the differences here? Um, I teach um, this uh, Muslim theologian, Al-Ghazali, and Al-Ghazali says that gossiping is a worse sin than adultery. Yeah, people read this and they think, what is he talking about? But it encourages this, this very interesting conversation. What do we mean by gossiping? In fact, the, the, um, the, the translators don't even use the word gossip. They use the word backbiting. So what is backbiting? What do we mean jokes? In other words, we can take these traditional texts, look at these questions, and find ways that they're relevant for, for our students. Um, 
And there are, there are all kinds of these examples. I love, there's a, there's a wonderful example from the Prajnaparamita Sutra, uh, which is a Buddhist text that says, the world exists, okay, we can all agree on that, but the world doesn't exist in the way we think it exists. Right, so then everyone looks at it. And it's this opening then to start talking about all these different ways that we can think about the world existing. If you're, a, if you're a quantum physicist, how do you look at the world? Uh, if you're a chemist, how do you look at the world? So that's my first one. Just choose a couple traditions to focus on. Um, the, my second strategy, um, and uh, again, it would be interesting to have a discussion with my colleagues here, but I would say emphasize the differences, not the sameness. Um, the students come into the class, at least in my experience, they want to look for what they mm-hmm. It's the, the natural tendency. But all of my experience is pointing me toward the differences. What's unique? What makes these worldviews different? Um, so, you know, we start out with Buddhism and Buddhism does not believe in a god. It is an atheistic tradition. And again, people it just sort of stops people cold in their tracks. But you can move on from there. Um, and it really it really pushes people to um, begin to see these differences. Um, I say in Hinduism, I always say, one God? The idea of one? How could you take the idea of the divine and squish it into just one? In the Hindu tradition, there are 330 million, according to one of the Upanishads. 330 million gods. Now that makes sense. Again, just bringing people to a point where they can just turn their worldview just a little. Um, and you know, I push on the I, this idea that there's no one Christianity. That's usually a little bit an easier uh, argument to make. People come from different Christian religious traditions. But then I push on that same issue for Islam. There is no one Islam. No matter how many times you read it in the newspaper and says, you know, Islam says this. Um, there is no one Islam. Um, as I say, students come in, they, um, if people are in these courses, well, I guess in some ways we're lucky because we don't have a religion requirement. Anybody sitting in our courses has chosen to be in that course. So many people come with um, you know, an interest in religion, and they've read a lot of popular books on religion, which is great in some ways. But the ideas that they come in with, again, are... Um, carrying them in this direction that all religions basically are the same. They basically do the same thing. And so I, I quickly move them out of that. So that's my second strategy. Um, my third strategy, building a group field trips. Not individual field trips, but group field trips. Um, and that's because I want people to meet real people who are practitioners of these traditions. I want them to participate in rituals. Um, let's see, today's Friday. So the day after tomorrow, I'm taking 40 students, two classes, to uh, the, um, a Hindu temple on the north side of Chicago. And we're all going to participate in the Sunday afternoon ritual. And they're really, the students are really nervous about it which is absolutely fine. Um, and, but it's, it's this wonderful opportunity to be a little uncomfortable, to walk into a space that is not American. So you, we now become the minority. Um, we're the minority also in the sense that we're not practicing Hindus, but we step into their space. And I've been taking students to this temple for more than 20 years. I know that the people are going to be welcoming, and it's going to be this fabulous experience. 
but I always build in these group field trips. So one, you know, so that people can get to meet um, actual practitioners of the tradition. But you can't just um, bring people to a site and expect it to be a learning experience. I do a lot of preparation ahead of time, preparing people for what they're going to experience, what they're going to see, and I create, <coughs> my voice is going, I create assignments for them to do based on the experience. So there are things they've got to observe, things they have to think about, um, and then ultimately things they're going to have to write about. So that they walk in, and I encourage them to just enjoy the experience, but they're not completely passive either because they know that they're going to be writing about this. These reflection exercises I always have due within about 24 hours. So I tell them it's important to jot down your ideas when your ideas are fresh. Um, one of the other things that going to these temples, these mosques, um, these centers does is the students see for themselves firsthand the differences. Uh, this is not like going to church on Sunday. It's really, really not. It's not like going to synagogue. It's really, really not. The other thing they begin to see is, even though I've read all these popular books maybe on Hinduism, this isn't what I expected. So there's a whole lot here I don't know. And that, and that has a good effect, too, because it opens people up to more learning. Um, but last thing I'll say about these, these field visits is, um, I've been teaching long enough now that you talk to alums when they come back and they say, oh, Professor Madden, you know, what I really remember about your class is we went to that Greek Orthodox church. I had never been in a Greek Orthodox church. And I still remember people hanging little emblems on the altar um, as they, as they um, said prayers asking for healing. Uh, in this particular church, there was a healing shrine. So they probably remembered nothing else that I taught. You realize that. <laughs> but, but, they, but they remembered this personal connection with the divine that they witnessed in this Greek Orthodox church. And, and that's really wonderful. Um, the, the, my fourth strategy is choose interesting texts. They have to be interesting to you as the teacher because we're going to teach them. And it's our excitement about the text, our love of the text that we're going to communicate. Uh, not everybody will love the same text we love, but we have to start there. So choose texts that you like teaching. Now, in addition to that, we also want to choose texts that are going to have some kind of relevance for our students. So that means we really want to know our students. Uh, teaching students at Lake Forest College, and I've taught in a number of different places, um, is different than teaching undergraduate students probably at DePaul um, or at University of Illinois, uh, you know, a host of other places. You have to know your students. Are they first generation students? Has anybody in their family ever gone to college before? Um, or do they come from an immigrant experience? Um, are their parents professionals? Um, are they urban? Are they suburban? You, are they traditional age students or non-traditional age? You really want to know about your students so that you can choose texts that will have some relevance for them. And you know, you know, we have our choice of lots of different texts. You know, there's way too much to teach. So let's choose the ones that will have relevance for the students and that we love. Um, you know, I forgot to watch the time. No, we're great. So, oh, we're okay. No, okay. Right. Um, so, all right, so in my last section here, I was thinking about improvements for the world religions model. And here I'm just going to interject uh, in response to Dove and to Jim. Um, so this isn't about improving world, uh, world religions, but I just have to throw this in. I have a rule in my classes, no technology. So cell phones have to disappear, laptops have to disappear, unless someone has a medical issue and they can only take notes on their laptop. And um, you do get a little bit of pushback sometimes, sometimes not at all. 
But I really find that people do pay attention much better. They're more engaged. Uh, and I, I did have a student once, only one student, but I, I hold on to this one student's comment. And she said to me, Professor Patton, you know, all my other classes, everybody takes notes on laptops, but you don't allow laptops. You know, we, we're we all really much more involved here. So, and, and, but I, I sense it also. Um, now, I also explain it. I say that there are studies that have shown that people don't multitask very well. We think we multitask well, but we don't. So if we're sitting and listening to the discussion or participating in the discussion, we're not also working on the laptops. There's also research that shows, um, as Jim mentioned, that when you have to think about what's being said, put it in your own words, and write it down with your arm and your hand, um, kinesthetically, we're involved in taking these notes, and they they, they sink in better. So it really does improve learning to actually take notes by hand. Um, they seem to believe me. They humor me. I'm not sure. But, um, but in any case, um, I, I, I am a believer in no laptops. And I know this is a much bigger discussion than what kind of our positions are. So these improvements to this uh, world religions model. Um, I had four ideas for improving it. One would be what I started out with at Lake Forest, splitting it into two. Now, of course, that's problematic because what are you going to use as the categories? You know, if we say, okay, we'll do the monotheistic traditions in one semester and the everything else traditions in the other semester. Are we privileging monotheism here? Maybe a little. Um, are we going to do the Asian traditions in one semester and the Middle East traditions in the other? Fine, except what do you do with Islam? Islam started out in the Middle East, but the greatest number of Muslims live in Asia. So, you know, it gets a little messy in that way. Um, maybe you do it by location. So if you're teaching, um, I don't know, let's say you're teaching in downtown Detroit, what religious communities do you have around you? And maybe you determine it that way. So you set up a world religions course that deals with Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity, because you know that you've got a Hindu community, a Muslim community, and a Christian community that you can build on for this class. I don't, and you see what I'm saying here, I really think it's a choice, and we can make that choice, and we can justify it in different ways. Um, the best, you can already tell, my, my uh, feeling is the best is if you can have separate courses for the individual religious traditions, but many times that's not possible. Um, sometimes it's possible, so a third possibility would be to teach different religious traditions using themes. So um, we try this at the college. So we have, you know, well, we don't have all these courses, but um, you, you could do a course in women and religion. But you look at how women or female religious images uh, are used and treated and work in, you know, three or four different religious traditions. You can do it with a lot of themes: religion and politics, um, religion and the environment. Religion, War and Peace, religion. I have a religion and film course that I teach. And in this religion and film course, I deal with a number of different religious traditions. And somehow, because we're working with films and, and the existential issues that come out of these films, I don't feel so bad that people are only getting a slice um, or a little view of a particular religious tradition. But again, it's a way to offer something to the students that they really do want. They really do want to know a little bit about a number of traditions and to do it in a way that's engaging. Um, we have uh, a course that we just developed uh, just uh, two years ago that we call Religion in Global Context. And Aaron had asked me about this. We actually developed it to be our methodologies course. So it would be a way to look at 
different ways of studying religion, you know, a sociological way, anthropological way, you all know about all these different uh, methodologies. But the, the traditions that you can use are, you know, are uh, traditions really around the world. Also the emphasis here, and this was very conscious on our part, um, as we look at the position of religion within the liberal arts at our institution and across the country. And we're making uh, somewhat a political argument, you might say, but we're making an argument in the title of this course. And the argument we're making is that religion is a global phenomenon. Um, and it is, so not only is it global, but given that fact, um, it also impacts many other areas of study in the liberal arts. So you can't really look at international relations unless you know something about religion. Um, you can't talk about anthropology unless you know something about religion. So it's an, what we wanted the college to see is that religion is a vital part of the liberal arts. And we also want our students to see that. We want our parents to see that. Uh, because studying religion makes you a more a, a better educated citizen, uh, maybe makes you a better international business person, uh, maybe it makes you better in terms of global communication systems and media. So that understanding religious traditions gives you a way to understand people in different parts of the globe. Um, last, just a little bit of advice. Absolutely take these jobs. I can tell you, I can tell you when we're looking to hire people, we always look for people who have some teaching experience. And this is great teaching experience. Um, you won't know everything when you start, as Dove was saying, you really won't. Uh, none of us did when we started, but you'll learn on the job and that's okay. You'll be pulling in all kinds of people who you know. That's great. Um, you should, I mean, not echoing here what Dove said, that you want to acknowledge what parts you know and what parts you don't know and offer to find out, um, you know, if people have questions, to find out those areas that you're, you're not knowledgeable in. But don't, you, you, you can't try to, um, um, what's the word here, sort of finesse it and make it seem like you know if you don't. So it's it's much better just to acknowledge where you are, but you will learn. Um, and I think it's, it's, it really can be uh, a great experience. So I would I would say take those jobs and enjoy them, and enjoy your students. Learn. Thank you all so much. We have a lot of insight on the table, and we have a good four years for a conversation. Um, before we open things up to, to general questions and ideas and interests, um, I have one specific question that I want to pitch as a way to open things up. Uh, please feel free to get more coffee, and uh, if you're interested in the, in the handouts that are here. <clears throat> what I'm interested in, uh, as a sort of way in here, how do each of you approach teaching what you don't know? Right? When you're in a position, whether that's when you're first getting started or continuing now, bringing something new into the into the classroom that you don't know well, you only have a minimum of, of experience with. How do you approach it, both in terms of your learning the material with teaching it in mind, but also in terms of actually presenting it in a way that's pedagogically productive when it's not something that, that you're an expert in? And and I think, as, as Dove was saying, that can maybe that can be a, be a benefit not to be an expert in it, but it's still something that I think a lot of us are have in mind as something that we need to be conscious of as we're doing it. No, I mean, I, I in, my, in my situation, I typically am not teaching, uh, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. I have to make sure that I know it because students that come to me during office hours and ask me a question, or I also have to make sure when I meet with my TAs to emphasize what what areas of each religion I think is, is crucial to emphasize. But so I, I don't think I'm the best person to answer that because I'm actually not the one lecturing in, 
areas that I really don't know. And you say you're doing it right now? I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm right now teaching a course, uh, Creation, Sexuality, and Family. And I, I, so I just took a year to say, okay, and it's all it's related to this Bishop Synod on the family. So, okay, I've done a hundred and I've done hundreds of weddings, but I've never really learned the theory of any of this. Um, so I just read for about a year, and and every, every now and then it's like I don't get this. I better go and see uh, the canon lawyer and say, do I have this right? And is this what the law? Is? You must be kidding me, really? <laughs> okay, so I took a year to learn it myself, and then I have the the principle of three. That is, the first time I teach a course. Uh, and the first time when I was chair that I had other people teach courses, the first time the course is okay. And you're kind of making it up as you go along. You're looking what's on YouTube. Uh, oops, that didn't work. Well, uh, and so it's, it's okay. You know, come on. I, we've all been to those courses and uh, we do the same thing. Come on, this is earth, not heaven. Um, Second time, the course is quite good, thank you very much, uh, because I made all those mistakes and didn't ask the right questions, and I thought what was important to me was simply not important to them. Um, it was all right, it was a good course. I'm kind of proud of that one. The third course, third time through, boy, is that good. I've gotten rid of the, the nonsense. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I know the stuff on YouTube. I know the films. I, I have a hunch where they're going to go. The third time, it's really good. But I, I, I go, the first time it was okay, it was fine, it's, you know, it's passable. Wouldn't want to do it again that way. Different mistakes next time. So that's the principle of three. I would echo that. And also the three, I never thought about it that way. The first time through, so you're, you're hearing from very experienced people here. Even now, when I develop a new course, I know that first year, the first time I do it, it's going to be a little bit rocky. I mean, it'll be fine. I know how to finesse it. I know how to... I know how to make it work, but deep down inside, I can see the things that I need to change, and I will change them the second year, and the second year is better, but the third year is the best. I think that's true. The other thing, I will echo again what Jim said, um, we all um, have to teach new things from time to time, and, and it's a good thing. It keeps us um, you know, thinking in new ways and active and, and engaged. Uh, I also read very broadly, but then I don't trust just the reading. So I seek out people in that area. And I say, if you have time for coffee, I'd love to just throw around these ideas with you. And, and that's the way it, it gets deepened. What happens the fourth time? <laughs> um, so you my, point, my point is obviously like, and I experience this, it's like, you, know, you reach that point where you think it's amazing, and then like the fourth time you don't have that sense of excitement, or you don't prepare as hard. So therefore, maybe the material isn't as fresh and crisp. And For me, it depends on how much I love the material. And if, if it's material I really love, I mean, I teach um, an introductory Hinduism and Buddhism class, and I've taught them forever. I just love the materials. Now, I, uh, my husband laughs at me, but if, even if it's the 25th time I'm reading it, I have to reread everything before, the, you know. before yeah. I teach yeah. it again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and somehow, not before I reread it, you know, just looking at the syllabus, I say, yeah, 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 I've done this a hundred times. But when I reread it, I say, oh, wow, yeah, I, yeah, I really do like this. <laughs> so it's the material that keeps it going for me. Yeah, for me, it's um, the, the fourth time and the fifth, it's always different because it's like, okay, what is... What new newspaper article has appeared that I can go to? What new YouTube has thing has around that I've took? And frankly, I don't keep real good notes about what I did the previous <laughs> time. The syllabus is fine, but when I actually get in the classroom, it's like, come on. Yes, and the other thing that's um, for me, it's uh, these. And it's back to my thing of who are these students that I'm teaching? It's like. She sits right over in that row, right over there, and she gave me that funny look in that last class. I better go back to that. Okay, yeah. Now I got this one over here that was complaining about that. Okay. And so, the, the, it's, to me, it's, 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 I'm not so much teaching. I am teaching content, but I'm more teaching students. And that inter, interpersonal kind of thing of, I really like these kids yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. for 11 weeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but, no, but I think it's an important point. You have to like your students. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it really is an engaged interpersonal process. Mm -hmm. If you don't like students, this is definitely the wrong conversation. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, let's open it up. Where does this hit the ground for, for us and, and where we are and where we're going? Yeah. So the first time you teach the class, how, and you get asked the question by Serena that you have no idea, you have no idea how to answer that. How do you be honest without making your students like overly skeptical and lose faith in you as a knowledgeable person? How do you how do you deal with the student? I off, I I would often say that is a fabulous question. It's quite complicated. So let's talk about it. You know another time or come to me during office hours. <laughs> Sometimes I do that, to be honest. Um, but then often I would, I'll say that, and then I'll say, yeah, I'm not really sure. You know, let me, let me get back to you, let me look that up. And they laugh and, you know. I think, I think students respect the, on, you know, ultimately the students respect the honesty, um, that you don't know everything. And that's totally fine, the great, great scholars of our day don't know everything, and it's. Uh, I think it's. I think it's okay to be to be honest and uh, be real. I agree, and I would just underscore what you're saying there, that you can complement the question not in a gratuitous way, but you begin to unpack the question. This is an interesting question because of this and this and this. Um, I can't really give you a good answer, or I can't give you an answer that's going to satisfy you and satisfy me right now. Or sometimes I'll say, you know, why don't you, you, you go look it up next time. Like, you know, <laughs> throw it back on them. You go find out. It's a great <laughs> question. Go look it up and let us and let us know. So it kind of, kind of empowers the, 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 the questioner to go and do some research and come back. It's a simple question, but I think it always comes up in religion courses. How do you deal with hostile students? either to yourself as a professor teaching on a religious tradition that they might hold very near and dear, um, or to, especially in a world religious context, to those who are hostile to other potential traditions you teach them out. Ah. I love giving my talk of this is a university. And in this university, this is what we do. Um, you might not want to do this right now at this particular point in your life, and I thoroughly understand that. And so please withdraw, because this is a university, and this is what we do. If, if you find this un, unsafe, then um, you need to, you're an adult. You got it, you're responsible for your safety. Let me give you five phone numbers in this university that can help you on this, on the safety issue. If, if you don't want to learn this content, there's 104 other courses. And frankly, if you don't like me, how about this? There are 40 religious studies professors around here, uh, and they're very different. And so please, you do what you got to do so that you can learn. And I'm going to teach this course in this university the best way I possibly know how. And I'll see you at your graduation. But let me just say, as a woman, I don't think that would work. Yeah, and that's, well, that's can I say this one more? I got, and I can, I can get away with all sorts of things because I got gray hair and because I'm old. And I'm a male. And that's absolutely right. Talk about women because this, oh, I got mad about this book. Yeah, I mean, there, there really are things that, that men can say. Um, I have these discussions yeah. often with my husband, who's also a college professor. He's in math and computer science, so different disciplines. But he'll say that he handled a situation like you're describing with a hostile student. And I'll say, in, in much the yeah. same way. And I'll say, I, it wouldn't work. For That's a right. Woman. So I have a different approach. Um, so what I, what I might say is, what I do say, because of course the situation does come up. Um, first of all, I wouldn't talk to that student in front of the class, probably, unless I got forced into it. But I'd rather talk one on one. Um, the other thing, so but, but what I say is my approach to teaching all these religious traditions is to stand within that tradition and see the world through the eyes, the windows, the lens of that tradition. And I can tell you, I say to the student, that over the years I've been doing this, when I teach Islam, people come to me and say, well, of course you think this because you're Muslim. And when I teach Hinduism, they say, well, of course you see it this way, you're a Hindu. And I, you know, I'm very pleased that people see me as so identified with that tradition. Because for the period of time I'm teaching it, I am identified with that tradition. So what I'm asking you as a student to do is to step inside another worldview. 
and see the world through through those eyes. But this is not in any way, um, I mean, my teaching is not in any way asking you to convert to another religious tradition. Um, I think it's really important that everyone has their own. But but try to separate out those two ideas. It's interesting to say, to say outsider. Out, outsider should should, should like have kind of have a sympathetic insider yes. perspective. And I would also say I agree with you, but I would also say the opposite. You know that if you're an insider <laughs> already, take yourself out of kind of look at your own tradition, ah. but put yourself on the outside of the tradition. Very and that's my problem. I have like religious uh, Jews who, who think that what I'm saying is <laughs> so heretical and all of this, and you know, so I have to meet with them and say, look, I'm not I'm not saying what you should, should or shouldn't believe, but if you look at, at the religion from an outsider, objective, neutral perspective, this is what this is what one sees. Um, I agree. Yeah. I think Neil and then Petra. How do you choose your texts for the most Particularly the one where you where you have to um, where you have to do all the religions in one term. How do you how do you pick the texts? Well I mean, our, our, our textbook and world religions, that we, we've gone through about four or five of them, and what we do is uh, we'll, we'll have a textbook and world religions, but if out of 500 pages, we'll have them read 200. Out of the 500, depending upon which religions we choose to, to, to teach that semester, we, t- we typically start in the East. Uh, we, we start with Hinduism uh, two weeks, Buddhism two weeks, Chinese religions, Taoism, Confucianism in all one week, midterm. And then we go, we go out, we go to the West. Um, although my, co- my my colleague, who's a scholar of Chinese, Chinese Buddhism, says to him, the Western religion is is Hinduism. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's on yes. The West. yes. Well, see, we go round and round with this idea of what's East, what's yeah. West. Depends on where you're standing. Uh, but but um, yeah, we're we're constantly uh, um, <clears throat> testing out new 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 textbooks in in world religions. I think we we've, we've kind of set our, our uh, the, uh, the Oxford textbook that's and that was put together by Broad, I think we think is the best one out there. I would certainly encourage it, the original text stuff. Uh, rather, at DePaul we made a decision, no, no tech, uh, of those world religion textbooks, simply because of the problems that were mentioned earlier. And so it becomes, okay, which original texts um, are we going to use? Um, I should add, we... we uh, not just the textbook, but we, at every single religion we study, we ask the the scholar of that religion to give us one or two key primary texts that the students could work on during their their section. So you know, in Judaism, it's not just well, a lecture about Judaism, but they'll have you know two pages from Maimonides, two two pages from from Kabbalah, or something. So I, we do have kind of a a mix of both. Follow. Benson, um, like your syllabus, um, that is, that, you know, we basically have primary text. Um, how, how do you, um, how do you make that selection? Uh, so, are, you, are you talking about the syllabus that I that I contributed here? Yeah. This religions yeah. of Asia. Yeah. How did but I? Choose? in general, what are your? I mean, I mean, if you have a textbook, then that's fine. That solves the problem. But and if you have other people who are giving you, things, like, like if you are trying to choose from all the stuff that's there. You know, for each of these religions, how do you do that? Um, well, what I did for Hinduism, just to take one, is I I do a kind of historical progression in Hinduism at the same time that I'm trashing the historical progression. So it's a little bit <laughs> um, But using that historical progression, the earliest texts that we have are, I mean, I just do one hymn from the Rig Veda. So, that, so we talk about the Vedic period, and I have one text really just one page, but we can talk about it in a while. And then we move into the Upanishads, because historically, but we don't do all of the Upanishads. We do Upanishads, sort of following what I said earlier, um, ones that I resonate with and things that I I think the students will resonate with and that will um, demonstrate the teachings that that are coming out in this Upanishadic period that will allow us to build to the Gita. I do have them read the entire Gita. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Is that? Um, yeah, beginning to. I, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm curious about maybe any general principles. It, to me, it's maybe the most anxiety-provoking aspect of this whole thing is um, 
you know, uh, I mean, uh, so much that one could read and should read, you know. Mm -hmm. Given the well, impossibility yeah, of I mean, covering it. Well, the other option for it would be to, to find a primary text that not necessarily relates to students, but that captures the, the bigger bigger ideas. I mean, take the Upanishads, you know, Atman is Brahman. I mean, that, you know, or the Purushasutta, per, 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 I don't know if that's the right, one. Right, the Purushasutta, yeah, I don't use it, but I don't But something like that, that, that then they can say, you know what, oh, look, here is where you can see the the caste uh, system, and here is where you can see this idea of, of, of Hinduism. Try to find texts that are that can repre represent the bigger the bigger concepts within the right. religious so you, tradition. Right. So you end up doing both, the, representing the big concepts and, then, and, and, I see. and what will really resonate. Uh -huh. But but back to your question again, you really have to let go of this idea of coverage. It, it's hard to do. You come out of graduate school, and that's really all you think about. But you have to let it go. I, one of the things that I do is uh, reviews of, um, so I'll be an external reviewer for a religion department at another small liberal arts college. I also do Asian studies programs. And so one of the programs, um, I, I can tell you, it's a liberal arts college in Wisconsin, the Lloyd College. It's a fine, wonderful college. And that religion department made a decision. They have two faculty. Only two faculty in religion. It's a joint religion philosophy. But anyway, only two faculty. One is um, has a specialization in Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism in particular, and the second has a specialization in Islam and specifically African American Islam. Those are the only two religionists on staff. Mm. So they made a philosophical decision to let go of coverage. You see, it, it just in terms of who they were hiring for the position, and then how they structured their courses. Now, so you have people trained in Buddhism and Islam teaching Christianity and Judaism. You reverse the, uh, the typical <laughs> model. Mm. But they say, why not? Mm -hmm. the, uh, I'm going to go back. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. You're going to be shocked when you go into a classroom how much you really know. The thing of, you're, I, I go into every class saying, do I know enough to teach 18 to 22 year olds? And my answer is always no. Um, and then I actually get in the classroom and I'm shocked by what they know and what I know, and there's quite a gap. Um, <laughs> and, and, so, and that the that, direction. <laughs> it depends on the topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We did hookup culture right, exactly. yesterday. They know a lot more than I know. <laughs> But, the, but the, 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 the kind of nervousness, I think, is wonderfully appropriate, and you're going to surprise yourself how much you really know, and it's, it's going to work out. A, a comment here. One of the reasons why I have opted at this point to do two, bio, two biographical type things uh, um, is because, a thing you said earlier, Christianity, oh my God. How many variations is the, are there how, in any world religious tradition? I'm, they're all isms. And for 18 to 22 year olds in a, a liberal arts curriculum, one of two courses, how am I best going to use the time? I'm going to focus, for me, it's, I'm going to focus on people. Uh, in this case, in this time, it was the Dalai Lama and Augustine of Hippo. Uh, learn those, and I can spin the, the. So I've got their version of Christianity, their version of Tibetan Buddha. There's a dozen other ones, and so. But you're not being a, you're not a doctoral student at the University of Chicago. You are doing one of two religion courses at DePaul undergraduate university. Uh, get realistic about expectations, and therefore what. So I couldn't agree more about the thing of coverage. It's no, it's not my issue. Fresh and then we'll go to that. If it's okay, I wanted to uh, chime in on the hostility yes. question, which is a uh, which is a perpetual fear. Um, one of the things that I do regularly, especially um, in the intro to uh, Hebrew Bible, which is also pitched as Jewish literature and thought, so it gets everybody <laughs> in there where they're coming from, uh, is to establish in the first two classes through a whole series of comments. Uh, what the project is in the classroom is comparative and it's focused on what people do and what they write. This is what we're doing. You know, we're studying what people did at religion and what are the things that they left behind that we now read, things that they wrote. And uh, I tell them, 
is comparative, which means the basis for the questions that we then analyze in order to, you know, we analyze the tool in order to answer are similar across all religions. And the reason to frame them that way is to create a comparative basis. And so everybody in the room is going to be upset. I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> Just take that as a given. It's the university project. It's a comparative one. And we piss everybody off. <laughs> if you can accept that, you know, it's, it's a thought experiment. You come into this room, and for one quarter, we're going to pretend we can do this. And if you can't just, you know, suspend your disbelief, you know, then, then it's not a for you. If you can, come out at the other end and know what you did. And the, the fi one of the final, uh, the final paper is a self-reflection piece on what was this course worth? What the experiment worth it? Where did you come from? Where are you going? What did you do? So that kind of, uh, I try to preemptively diffuse mm -hmm. uh, by setting it up as part of the study of religion. So, you know, sometimes that works. <laughs> I'm still here. A technical question. Thank you all three of you for your presentation. And you, you talked about this. I um, think objects are very interesting for the kind of students that you're going to teach or well in the class because it puts them in concrete situations and concrete situations are already complicated. You have cultural stuff, you have language that is different, you have a book that is there, you have all sorts of things, you have statues, arts, you can work on many things. But I'm always very worried and anxious about the field trip. So I wanted to ask you, um, don't, the best case is the one that you described on convention, right? You prepare, you bring the students yourself, so you're there, and then you ask them to do the work as, as quick as possible. Now, uh, there are other situations where you can, you might be teaching online, which means that you won't be with your students in any way. Uh, two, you can be in a place where you don't have the support of the administration, or you don't have the funds all the time to bring your students, so you have to tell them to go by themselves, and uh, you can still prepare, but it's much more complicated. So what's your thought about this? Can you, do you think that if you can go with your students, that's not even worth it? Do you think that's still worth it? Uh, do you have any advice about this? Um, I, um, I believe very strongly in experiential learning. <coughs> So I would say even if you can't go with them, if you're doing an online course, I would still have people go. However, you're pointing out some very real issues that do come out, uh, do come up, and you have to be ready for them. Um, I mentioned this temple that I'm going to on Sunday that I've been going to for over 20 years. So this is the Iskon Temple. I don't know if people know. It's the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, also known as the Hare Krishnas. Great group of people, but they they practice a particular form of, well, they do a particular form of Hindu practice. But, like many practicing religious people, they see their own form as the best form, truest form, only form. You can see what I'm saying here. So one of the things that I did early on, well, early on what they wanted to do is I would call and say, I'm bringing a group of students, and they would say, great, we'll organize a little teach uh, teaching area for you, and our teachers will teach your students. I did that once. Yeah. And so now I never tell them when I'm coming. They know they know that I, that I that I just come, and I always bring a donation. I think that's important, and they're they're very happy to have me. They know that I'm respectful of the tradition. But even still, one of the assignments I give to my students is so when we're sitting and having lunch with the devotees, talk to them. Ask them how they got involved. Ask them what they think about the tradition. Ask them anything you want. They, they will love to talk to you. So then we come back to class, and then people compare their different stories that they got from the different devotees. And they will get different stories. So you have to be prepared for that. And what I do is I use it um, as a time to talk about how 
different people part of a religious community can see it in different ways, think about it in different ways. I, for the quiz, for the exam, you have to look at it academically and according to the academic materials that we're reading for class. But you should know that um, different people do see it differently. And this is real. I then say to them, if you were to go to your synagogue or you would go to your church and ask people, what's going on? Explain to me what's going on. You would get lots and lots of different explanations. And people can relate to that and they see, you know, so there's, again, the academic study of religion um, and when you're talking to people about what they do, what you have to be careful about is to maintain that level of respect that even though different people have different ideas about what this religious ritual is, I might disagree, but I respect I respect them in their views. And so I try to help the students maintain that level of, of respect. But but you have to be ready for all those things. In a similar way, that business about experiential learning, I, I, I also, we have two courses. One is Religions in Chicago, which is more than mm. go. But my absolutely favorite assignment that I give in this particular course is having read only one one or two chapters of the varieties of religious experience, but the whole book is way too long and it's a mess. But now go find someone over 40 who claims to have had one of these William James-style religious experiences and interview them. And normally they're, they're going to be their boyfriend or girlfriend's mother or father or parent <laughs> or somebody in their own family. And what it does is it, it, it incredibly personalizes some of these claimed religious experiences and, the, and it, uh, religion takes on a different kind of vitality when it's, good God, my girlfriend's mother had an experience of the dead when her father died and, well... Please compare that to what you read in chapter three. Now make some sense out of that. Is your girlfriend's mother a nutcase, or is the world much more wonderful than you ever dreamed it was based upon you talking to your girlfriend's mother? But uh, that one, you've, you've got to be a little bit careful um, with who you're interviewing, what you're saying about them. And in some places, institutional review boards on human subjects are going to want to get involved in this. Um, that DePaul, you can kind of stay underneath and don't push it. Again, just, just one last comment, because this, this whole thing of when you take people into an experience, you really don't know what's going to happen. That's you don't right. know what the students are going to do. You don't know what all the people, in this case at the temple, are going to do. That has to be OK. You really do give up control and just have trust in yourself that you will be able to make sense of it on the other side as long as you maintain this level of respect for everybody involved. Marsha? Uh, Price, so you're over a whole bunch of DAs. Uh, two One, what's your pool for the DAs? Uh, and then two, what are your expectations for them um, dealing with 30-some you know, students uh, in these uh, discussions? <coughs> yeah. Pool meaning where, where do we find the yeah. Uh, TAs? Yeah. Well, we um, at Illinois, we just started a, a master's program in religion. so. Um, those that that the, the, the top the top MA students, we typically ask them to TA for this course. This okay. is a great a great way to begin the the, 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 the program. Um, but if we don't find enough um, MA students in from religion, we we turn to other graduate students and other departments that have reached out to us. Um, who may be working on a, a project that's related to religion. So we have a doctorate program in education. Many of them are interested in doing religious education. So we'll draw upon those those graduate students. Or we have, let's say, PhD students in anthropology that are interested in, in, in religion. So we kind of make connections and, and, and find those people. Um, um, in terms of our, our, our expectations, with regard to world religions, so Depending upon how experienced they are, we either ask them to do two, two sections a week, so they'll have two classes of 30 students each, or for the more advanced students, uh, um, or those who are on the, I guess, higher up on our, our you know, we'll have like the top, our top graduate student, our second, you know, kind of their, their um, what's the word there? The lifted, the tiered, right. So some of them will have three, three uh, sections, and, they're responsible um, to 
really decide how they, what they want to do in their section. I mean, this is a big question. What do they do? Are they just reviewing the lectures to make sh make sure that the students know what was going on? Um, you know, the lecture on Taoism and Confucianism or Buddhism, you know, or Zen Buddhism. Um, or are they there to answer questions and maybe work on a, work together with their students on a on a primary text? And and the truth is that really depends upon the TA. I give them flexibility with, with where to go on that, and it, it probably also depends upon how good the lecturer was. You know, if they're not very good, you know, uh, you know, they're going to need to review everything. Really, um, sometimes the lecturer is very difficult to understand. You know, we once had a lecturer who. From other departments. From other departments, uh, yeah, from far, far away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had a lecturer who, who his, uh, her accent was so heavy that students didn't had such a hard time just just understanding the words. So I would meet with my I meet with my TAs once a week okay. for a half hour, you know. So we laugh or you know we kind of have that camaraderie. But then I also uh, say, you know, what, this week we're gonna have to go over everything. You know, don't even think about looking at primary texts. Um, other times, when lectures lectures are amazing, um, they'll they'll work on the primary text because one of the things that um, and they and they they do the grading also for for the writing assignments. The midterm and final are all multiple choice. Fifty questions, multiple choice for the midterm. Fifty questions, multiple choice for the final. But our TAs are doing all of the all of the grading. I won't. I'm not there. Students can't come to me and ask me to re regrade uh, their 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 papers. Um, what what so the papers in the past we've asked students to maybe compare you know certain themes in Hinduism versus Buddhism. You know what what, the, what they both traditions have Dharma. Both traditions have samsara, both traditions have, you know, X, Y, and Z, how, how are they different? Or, you know, what are the differences between, you know, Judaism and Christianity on X, Y, and Z? But lately we've realized that that may be too difficult for students who are just starting out. So in recent semesters, we've shifted focus to ask them to write on the primary texts themselves. So take two primary texts and talk about how these texts are representative of the religions. And could you see any any commonality or divergence between two primary texts that you've seen in the in the in the semester? So what then I ask the TAs to do is maybe um, on on uh, on those religions where the lectures were pretty good to start working through the primary texts with the students to to help them kind of get 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 an, some kind of an immediate experience. With a religious tradition, you know, because without that, you know, it's just kind of lectures and, and, and a textbook. You don't really get to feel connected to the actual tradition. So uh, there are times where I'll meet with students and we'll go over the primary text as a group to make sure that all the TAs understand the primary text and the significance of the primary text. And I'm also there to meet with TAs one on one if they have um, particular struggles in in their section. I'll sit in on their section and offer feedback in terms of their teaching, or if they're confused by something, um, you know, I, I offer my, my my help with that as well. We have time for two more questions, and I want to take them. Um, just keep my eye on the clock, so we can invite it to. Let's take them both together, and then have. <clears throat> Comments and I'll have a final sort of synthetic, synthetic question. So Drew and then Kelly, please. Sorry. Here, Raj. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, my question is, thank you all for your comments. I think a thing that was running through all of them was that we teach students how to think in the classes we teach. Right? And something that's instrumental to that is learning how to observe the differences and changes around us, and then to collate them, and then to, to figure out how that is happening. Um, so then the question is, is how important is it to prime the students to this type of thought? Um, or is it, in your own teaching style, um, important to let that sort of aha moment happen on its own? Uh, and then um, how quickly do students buy into that project, or do they not at all? Um, so those are my questions, I guess, there. And, and mine actually relates right. very closely, maybe a little bit of taking a broader approach. Um, which is, we, we've talked a lot in the craft and teaching, teaching um, sessions about this idea of letting go of coverage, you know. Um, so when you let it go of that and you're thinking about the course you are designing, um, 
so no longer is it I have to cover all these things. So how do you decide what you do cover? And I think a, a lot of the ways we talked about that um, in line with this question is do you have skills in the particular, is it is it big ideas? Is it a particular skill like critical thinking or creative thinking? Is it um, close reading we talked about? Do you have things, are you explicit about that to yourself and to your students? Or does it, at the end, you're like, oh, that's a good thing that happened, I'm glad. Um, you know, in terms of, of thinking about course design, and I, especially when you say, oh, we're not going to cover everything, you know, just pick something, what, what then becomes a priority? Well, I can tell you one way that I try to engineer the aha moments. I, I don't know if I'm going to answer all the pieces of the question here, but. Um, and, and I actually um, learned this from someone who's a fellow graduate student. Um, one of the things we really haven't talked about much the, um, this afternoon is the importance of ask, uh, creating really good assignments, writing assignments. And um, what my friend uh, told me that she did, and, and I can explain to you how I do this, but is you, so you take a text and you have the ideas that you want the students to get out of that text, but you want them to work with those ideas in some kind of a writing assignment. And so the best way to do that is to connect it to their own lives. So let me give you an example. Um, well, this is one I just used. So, um, so in the Bowen Beat, the central dynamic is that the central character has a conflict of what we say dharmas, conflict of his sacred duties. So, you know, he has a duty to be a good family member. He also has the duty to be um, a good member of society, sort of hold, holding up his responsibilities in society. But that doesn't say it very well. The idea is you want two dharmas, two duties that you're equally pulled between. So I say to students, it's your dharma to be the best student you can be. Um, it's also your dharma to be the best son or daughter or niece or nephew or friend that you can be. What happens when you feel pulled between two of these duties at the same time? So I say, think about sometime you were in a situation like that. <clears throat> now, we've already discussed the Gita and the advice that that main character has gotten from the god Krishna. And I say, take at least three, two or three elements of advice that Krishna has given the main character and see if you can apply Krishna's advice to your situation. Would it turn, have turned out the same? Would it have turned out differently? And I just finished grading this set of papers. They were marvelous papers because people talk about, you know, real internal conflicts. And if they are able to relate, if they really understood Krishna's teachings, then they can take Krishna's teachings and apply them to their own situations. So I think, at least my hope is, that these kinds of papers, people enjoy writing them, and it creates these aha moments. OK, so this is what this advice means on the ground. This is what it would mean for me. Um, otherwise, you're talking about a character from you know, the fourth century BCE, you know, who was a soldier, I mean, maybe didn't have all that much, doesn't have all that much in common with you. So the assignment is a way to, to um, for you to use the, the learning in a personal situation. I just, I just want to uh, respond to that. Uh, in, in a state university, oh. uh, just, we, we have to be really careful not, not to, uh, to really create a, se a separation between church, uh, church and state so that I think it's great. That idea is fabulous, but I would be I would do it in a in a, oh, okay. in, a in a private you know you know a school. Oh. But I would always get I get worried about you know implying in any way that anything we're studying here is actually tr true in any in any sense. So um, in other words, we're studying other cultures and other histories, and whether it's true or not, you figure that out when you when you go home when you leave the classroom. In this classroom, okay. we're just studying what other people think, what other people do. So um, 
Very I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm saying that I would just be, uh, from 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 what I'm, what I'm teaching at okay. State University. You know, I mean, we had a hard enough time as it is getting a Department of Religion because they said, well, we can't teach religion here. <laughs> I, I We're a state university. Right. right. <laughs> See, but I'm careful of doing that in a private Catholic school, being a Catholic priest. <laughs> and so my my thing about this is, ah, hmm, this is a very interesting idea. Hmm, afterlife. Hmm, gab gab gab. Why is it that reasonable and prudent people over a course of centuries would come to believe something like that? Mm. And why is it that reasonable and prudent people over a course of centuries would come not to believe right. in that? Right. Well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> hmm. Okay, next next topic. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, for me it's why is it that reasonable and prudent people, what kind of experiences that did people possibly have that brought them to that position, or at least they're wrestling with that idea? And they find it intriguing enough to weave it into a religious worldview. Your question, sir, my answer is both. It's like I just tell them, ladies and gentlemen, this is how you read a text. Here, put it up here. I'm, you know, here is the text. It's up now, flashed up here. Let's please read it. And then I'm in a model. Why is that word here? What is the, there's, notice this little adjectival phrase here. What's that? Do, why is that one? And then we have a requirement in, in our university of in the first two weeks you're to give a written assignment that's to be gotten back by the third week. It's called we, and it's low impact assignment on the final grade. And so okay, for the class I'm teaching right now, it's here's your assignment. Tell me what you learned growing up about marriage and family life. Oh my God, I'm absolutely depressed by what they learned by, by word and deed. By word and deed. Uh, but then the key is for, in, in this assignment is a, I learned some of the, what the field is like, but also as I read it, I am being so picky about words and writing all over it. Why is this word here? And do you mean this? So, in other words, what I want to model for them both in my classroom activity up here and then by the paper that they're going to get back. Uh, He's doing close reading. Yeah, I am. And so please, you learn to do this too, because that's general objective number two of this whole university, and general objective number three A in over here. And so you should learn to do that. You're going to be a happier and better person because of it. So both. This is what I'm doing. And then sometime around week nine, if we're lucky, the aha moment will happen. But I'm a group William James. You can't force those things. They have <laughs> It's a mystery. Can I, can I just ask Doug yeah. uh, one thing? I mean, because you, you raise a really interesting point. So, if I was using a teacher that wasn't a god like Krishna, but a teacher like Dwangsa, because I do a similar thing with Dwangsa, would that be just as problematic? In other words, using Dwangsa's teachings in one's own life? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think philosophy was, too. Right? Yeah. So being sort of a long gradient. Right. right. Is well. Is Juan's Juan's is a, re, a religious thinker, right? Well, I would depends say how you it depends on how you think of right, it. Yeah. Right. I don't know, but that's close. Okay. I don't know. So we're just about out of time, but one final synthetic question, really just a minute each, is how do you how do what does the category of world or worlds mean to each of you? <laughs> do you want to specify any more? Than what what pedagogical uh, use do you, uh, do you make of the category of world in world religions, uh, religious worlds in comparative perspective, etc.? Is is there something that makes a world a religion a world religion? Is there something that makes a point of view a worldview, or not? Is that something that gets thought about at all? The academy has its rules and its regulations, and we set things up, and we do our thing, and that's the way we like it that way. And so the reason it's a world religion is because we said so. Now, might we be wrong? And might we be narrow? Yeah, we really might be. But in this artificially created thing, like a curriculum, with authors who write books based on what they know and are interested in, well, that's the world. Much to my unhappiness, on occasion unhappiness. I mean, I would say, I mean, first is like, you know, how many how many devotees there are, how many adherents. So you take the, you know, the largest number of of, uh, of practitioners. Seven six. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, 
<laughs> maybe, Ju- well, maybe Judaism should be there, and then you have, you know, you certainly have more Buddhists and, you know, Taoists and Confucianists, mm-hmm. and, right? I mean, it's a world that becomes a, becomes quantitative. Yeah, I mean, your question is a I'm great question, and, and, I, and I need more time, uh, obviously, to yeah, think yeah. that's a great question. But I mean, my first reaction would always just be, well, who is it? It's, it's an open question. It's an open question. Final well, thoughts? well I, I think it is an intriguing question, and I think it pushes us back to um, these categories which we've accepted, but, they, but the categories really do go back to, I mean, at least from what I study, back to the colonial period. And so do we really want to be using terms that were meaningful in the colonial period that we've in some ways rejected? So it's a, it's a good question. So that's all from, from us. Uh, if you haven't signed in, please see Marshall. Please take coffee on your way out. And please help me thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.